Hello and welcome to this uh, CTSNet Hangout. Um, my name is Patrick Myers. I'm an associate editor for CTSNet. And we're here today to uh, discuss the Orbita trial, which has uh, had a lot of uh, discussion among cardiologists and on Twitter. And we thought it would be of interest uh, to um, uh, go over and discuss that with uh, two experts that we have here uh, this evening. Um, Professor David Taggart, um, could you introduce yourself? Good evening, Patrick and Mike. Thanks for inviting me to join you. This is the first time I've tried this, so it'll be interesting to see how this works. But anyway, I'm a cardiac surgeon in Oxford and professor of cardiovascular surgery at Oxford University. Thank you, David. Um, and we have uh, Professor Michael Mack. Could you introduce yourself, please? Sure, absolutely, Patrick. Thank you for asking me to do it. It's a pleasure to join uh, you and David uh, on this Hangout. Uh, my first time also. So I'm a cardiac surgeon in the United States. Uh, I am the uh, chair of the cardiovascular service line, uh, which means it's both cardiology and cardiac surgery uh, for Baylor Scott & White Health in Dallas, Texas in the US. Okay, thank you very much. So before we go into the trial itself, uh, I think um, there's some important uh, data that we should go over on the population that was studied in this uh, Orbita trial. So this was stable. Um, could either of you give us an overview of, uh, of what we know, um, some important trials on, on this subject, and, and what these um, investigators were trying to answer with this trial? Mike, do you want to go first? Or? No, all yours, David. You've been you've been up you've been up uh, on on a trans uh, trans Asian flight. So uh, you you go first. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much. So I think we have to put Orbita into context of what else we know, and the most important trials that we've recently been involved with from the surgical perspective have been Syntax Freedom. Excel and Noble. But these, of course, were all trials of either multi-vessel disease or left main disease. Now, Orbita is a different trial because it was a trial of 200 patients in five centres in the UK who had single vessel coronary disease. And that was demonstrated to be both visually very important with a mean stenosis of around 85%, but it was also shown on FFR to be functionally very significant with FFR values below 0 0.7. And essentially, what the investigators did was they optimized these 200 patients for six weeks with optimal medical therapy, and then they randomized them to either a drug eluting stent to treat that significant stenosis, or a sham procedure, which is that the catheter was passed into the coronary artery, but there was then no active intervention on the lesion. And then what they found was when they re-examined these patients at six weeks, they found no significant increase in exercise capacity in between the PCI and the sham group, and no difference in the frequency or severity of angina or quality of life. So the authors understandably then interpreted the data, saying that a large part of the benefit of PCI in this elective setting was a placebo effect. Okay, thank you very much. That's, thank you for the overview of the, the study design. Um, now, why were, the, um, why were the authors looking so much in exercise capacity and symptoms? Um, why weren't they looking at any other uh, hard endpoints at, at, this, at this time? Well, they chose to do the study and conclude at six weeks because they argued quite legitimately that the maximum effect of the PCI intervention occurs immediately and therefore they felt that at six weeks they would have expected to see a clear benefit if the rationale for PCI in terms of improving exercise capacity and symptoms was justifiable. But this study clearly demonstrated no effect or no difference between the sham procedure and the active intervention. Now, what, what impact do you think that these results will have on the treatment of stable coronary artery disease? Well, it's a great question, and I think we have to be a bit cautious because it's a six-week study, and also it was single-vessel disease, and we as surgeons rarely operate on patients with single-vessel disease. As you know, it's not indicated in the guidelines, and it would be uncommon for us to do single-vessel IMA grafting now, although one can argue that if you look at the 20-year patency 
of the internal mammary artery to the LED, you could argue that this should be offered more frequently than it currently is. Especially that close to 70% of the patients included in this study did have an LAD, a proximal LAD disease. That is correct. But again, I would emphasize, we as surgeons look that recently at a study from Australia showing the patency of both ITA grafts to the LAD at being over 90% at 20 years of follow-up. So, you know, you can argue that this should be a benefit more routinely offered to patients with proximal LED and certainly with complex proximal LED disease. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, coming back to the, uh, to the study design, um, very interesting that they chose um, PCI versus sham procedure. Um, uh, maybe, Michael, you could comment on this. In, in the U.S., would would this type of um, uh, randomized prospective trial um, pass an IRB? Would this be something that would be doable? Um, so so the, the short answer is, is yes. Uh, it is the most scientifically rigorous way to design a trial. Uh, it does uh, help account for the placebo effect. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there is a trial that's just starting in the United States uh, for the treatment of mitral regurgitation with a device called the Caroline device, uh, that the patients are randomized for uh, a, a device put in the coronary sinus versus a sham procedure. Um, there was also a very famous study in the United States a number of years ago uh, looking at degenerative joint disease in the knee uh, in uh, arthritis patients in which the patients underwent a sham procedure. So it is, they are difficult trials to execute and to enroll and perform, but they are scientifically the most rigid. And I commend the authors of this study uh, uh, for doing that. Um, you know, this is a follow-up to the COURAGE trial that showed that, you know, medical therapy really does work. So in some ways, we shouldn't be too surprised by the results of this trial. What I guess was surprising to me is that this was even um, in the face of hemodynamically significant lesions by FFR. But I think that, you know, the other aspect of this is we know that um, PCI does not save lives. It's never been demonstrated to prolong life, it's been a quality of life issue. And here, what we see is that, at least in the short term, and David emphasized this, it's only six weeks, uh, that medical therapy was as good uh, for um, uh, patients uh, as PCI for quality of life and relief of symptoms. However, we well know, uh, at least in the United States, that compliance with medical therapy, either due to medication expense, medication side effects, um, is uh, a totally uh, a, a major issue. And, and there's some patients that would just say, if I have option between medical therapy or just fix it, are going to fix it, even though the results may not be better, at least they're the same. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. That, I think that's a, a, major, um, a major effect or a major issue with uh, all these trials on PCI is, and which was mentioned in, in the um, uh, FAME trials and in the COURAGE trials, um, was the crossover in the FAME2 trials, the crossover effect between PCI and optimal medical therapy, that in a trial which did not have a sham group. Um, and here, this one with a sham uh, procedure group, we see a, a very uh, interesting effect uh, of, of this sham procedure. Now, regarding the, the follow-up time, uh, obviously for ethical reasons, they could not wait more than six weeks before actually going um, uh, ahead with the, uh, uh, the randomized procedure and then six-week follow-up. Um, but I, I do believe that there are uh, quite a few uh, trials out there that would tend to say that the placebo effect of an intervention decreases with time. Um, and, and so that the, um, with a longer follow-up time, perhaps the results would be more favorable to optimal medical therapy. Do you so agree I, with that? Or? Yeah, I, I think that's right. And I, just to go back and pick up on a few very important points Mike made. The first is to realize that 
when we take into account the results of the courage trial which was over 2000 patients and followed out to past five years there was absolutely no benefit of pci versus optimal medical therapy although the number of patients prepared to stay on medication was not as high as one would have liked to see and indeed we've just completed a meta-analysis that has been accepted for publication comparing all the contemporary trials of PCI versus cabbage. And what we see is that the cabbage patients are on substantially or receive substantially inferior medical therapy compared to patients undergoing PCI, but despite that have a better clinical outcome. And of course, one would argue that if the cabbage patients were receiving optimal medical therapy, then the improvement in survival that is witnessed against PCI could have been even greater. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the importance, and you've demonstrated very well, the importance of optimal medical therapy uh, cannot be denied. Absolutely. Um, now, an, another point is, um, what, what should this trial have, although these were not surgical patients, um, they do deal with uh, ischemic coronary disease patients. Um, what impact should this uh, trial have on, on the trials that we are designing and working on currently in surgical patients? Should it have any? Mike, do you want to take that? Um, <clears throat> well, I'm, I'm hesitating a little bit in answering because I'm not quite sure what the impact would be uh, on surgical trials. Uh, you know, we do have a, a trial that has uh, that is started right now called the hybrid trial in which patients with multivessel coronary uh, disease are randomized between a minimally invasive lemur to the LAD and stents to the remaining vessels versus uh, stents alone. I think all of, I, I don't see that trial being impacted by this. I, I think that the uh, halo effect of this trial would be for everybody not to forget about medical therapy, uh, especially when the patient poses some significant risk uh, uh, to a surgical procedure or to PCI. That, that I think we accuse cardiologists of falling prey to the oculostenotic reflex. Uh, I think we, we tend to do the same thing in surgery. The um, lesson of the way that we should move uh, is toward routinely doing FFR on intermediate lesions and determining whether a vessel needs to really be bypassed uh, or not. Uh, this trial doesn't shed any light on that, but I think is going to give everybody pause to just say, oh, yeah, there's medical therapy, uh, and it really does work, at least in the short term. So, again, I agree with Mike. Uh, you know, I don't think it will impact to a great extent on surge, what we do in, in conventional cabbage surgery, because already the gold standard is the mammary artery to the LED, which is in reality the only intervention ever been demonstrated to improve longevity in patients with coronary artery disease so no one's going to change that practice of course we're arguing that there should be more use of multiple arterial grafts and we will soon by early next year have the results the 10-year results of the art trial and what will be interesting to see there is what is the overall effect at 10 years of two arterial grafts and also at five years in the art trial there was a signal towards improved survival in patients less than 70 years of age with a p-value of 0.08. So I think we'll have much better evidence regarding how many arterial grafts patients should routinely get. However, it's still very difficult to argue against data which shows, as I've already alluded to, the patency of both ITA grafts being over 90% at 20 years of follow-up. So it's difficult to ask, to understand why that should not be the gold standard in most patients undergoing coronary bypass grafting. Oh, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, do you have any, any other remarks regarding this trial or any, any closing remarks? One, one thing I think, when we look at the, and I've debated this recently at a very important meeting in South Af with the South African Heart Association and now in Japan, as I personally don't think we will see any other trials of PCI versus cabbage. I think when you go to cardiology meetings now, there is no longer even any discussion about the treatment of multivessel disease. Everything's focused on left main because of the apparent benefit of or, or neutrality of 
PCI and cabbage at three years. But of course, at what the cardiologists are currently kind of turning a blind eye to is that signal of crossover and survival at three years, which just failed to reach statistical significance, but which at five years with the divergence of survival curves will almost definitely be statistically significantly in favor of cabbage. So I personally cannot see after syntax and Excel, and the costs of these trials were enormous. Synt Excel was over $50 million, and I can't see that with the, what I would say, negative results for PCI versus cabbage, that anyone else would be prepared to do another trial and finance another trial of PCI versus cabbage, because I think the results in totality are so in favor of coronary bypass grafting. So, so, so I agree with everything David said there. I don't see, think we are going to see any more comparative effectiveness trials. And I also agree with him that if you look at the uh, survival lines at three years in Excel, that they will be significant at five years. I, I don't think there's any doubt about that. Um, but the question is, how much of an impact is that going to have on clinical practice? I think the Notion trial has also will show the, the, the same thing. Um, but I do think a major lesson from this trial is, as you alluded to, Patrick, to begin with, uh, this was a sham controlled trial. It really can be done. Uh, it can be done well. Um, and it is the scientifically most rigorous. Um, we've done a number of randomized trials in what's called the CTSN network in the United States um, that has compared surgery to either medical therapy or another procedure. Uh, and every single one of those trials, uh, there's been seven of them now, I have predicted the answer wrong. So um, that, that's a major lesson to me is we don't know what we think we know. And yeah. although there's always questions about the generalizability of randomized trials to the real world, um, it is the scientific rigorous thing and, and we need to continue to do them. And if I can make one final comment, I actually think the major effect of Orbita will be in the new guidelines because the, bit, the strongest class 1A indication for PCI is in patients with one or two vessel disease with or without proximal LAD involvement. So I can only see that Orbita is going to lead to a major rewriting of those recommendations for PCI. Oh, absolutely. I agree totally with uh, with David there. Well, um, if that's all we we have today, thank you very much for your expert opinions and, and very good analyses on uh, this Orbita trial, um, its impact or perhaps lack thereof on our practice, but certainly a, an important trial to know and uh, a very big impact on uh, the management of coronary artery disease um, more in, in general so in our heart team. So, Patrick, thank you for asking me to do this. And it, it's kind of nice what I'm learning on Hangout here is that David has much better artwork on his wall at Oxford than <laughs> you or I do. Patrick, thank you for inviting me to take part. This has been a really interesting exercise. And again, thanks to Mike for his ever wise comments. Great. Thank you very much.